Earth, its surface is three-fourths water. Yet only a tiny fraction of this water sustains life as we know it. Water, so common and yet so precious. Los Angeles, 75 years ago. A water shortage threatens the region's ability to survive and grow. 14 members of Southern California communities come together to bend their shoulders to the task. Water for Southern California. This is the story of the Metropolitan Water District. Nineteen hundred. Los Angeles boasted over 100,000 residents, yet its water resources were vanishing quickly. One of LA's great water pioneers, William Mulholland, envisioned an aqueduct to channel water to Los Angeles from Northern California. 100,000 men worked feverishly to complete this aqueduct, the world's largest, in five years. In 1913, as 30,000 Los Angelinos watched, water from the Sierras poured into the San Fernando Valley Cascades. As Mulholland proclaimed, there it is, take it. One of the world's most ambitious water projects was a success. Yet it was soon to be not enough. L.A. was growing. By 1913, there were nearly 400,000 citizens. People and cities needed water. So following Mulholland's 1923 course to the Colorado, hundreds of men surveyed more than 60,000 square miles of remote, harsh terrain. It was one of the biggest surveying projects in history. The daily pay was $3 plus room and board. 1920, the LA region had grown to a million citizens. Something had to be done, and fast, about upcoming water shortages. Gathering at the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena in 1928, prominent members of communities from Los Angeles, Orange County, and today's Inland Empire met to form the Metropolitan Water District's Board of Directors. W.B. Whitsett, the founder of Van Nuys, was elected chairman. Since then, 14 have served to chair the Metropolitan Water District with dedication, guidance, and vision. When Metropolitan first started in 1928, there was a group of people that put together a program that was second to none. They had a lot of guts in putting this thing together because they had the foresight to know that this was something that was really needed. When they put this aqueduct together, when they put Metropolitan together and decided to build the aqueduct, they didn't even have the customers to buy the water that they were going to bring down. But thank God they did. Meanwhile, the federal government had its own water plans for America's Southwest to build a dam on one of the nation's largest rivers. Arizona tried to stop it, but President Calvin Coolidge signed Boulder Dam into law. By 1931, the way was clear to build the largest dam in the world. Boulder Dam, soon to be called Hoover Dam, was part of the U.S. government's strategy to supply water and power to the expanding western states. The new Metropolitan Water District did its share, too. It launched a bond drive to raise $220 million to build an aqueduct. The Met spearheaded a promotional campaign to educate the voters. Water District. The movie Thirst was produced. It featured an appearance by Chairman Whitsitt, as well as stories about water shortages. It was full of good, clean water. Welcome, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome... Dramatic radio plays were written and aired. And editorials and advertisements ran in newspapers. Metropolitan pushed hard to get out the vote. Political rallies were held. On voting day, every bottle of milk delivered came with a flyer urging people to get out and vote. The victory was a landslide. Whitsett, Weymouth, Matthews, Deemer. These Metropolitan pioneers would soon start the largest water project in history. It was the Great Depression, and a huge project like the aqueduct meant jobs, tens of thousands of them. In 1933, 
Work began on one of the world's most formidable construction feats ever, a 242-mile aqueduct to one of the world's harshest deserts. They also built four dams and five pumping plants. Hundreds of miles of roads, water, power, and telephone lines were built through undeveloped desert, along with camps to house and feed the workers. Metropolitan has some of the world's best engineering talent on staff and workers who embodied a strong work ethic. 35,000 men worked 24 hours a day in eight-hour shifts, 365 days a year. Meanwhile, 150 miles upstream, Hoover Dam was completed in 1935. President Roosevelt himself came west to throw the switch and start up the power of the world's biggest dam. I call you to life. Just south of Boulder Dam, work started on Parker Dam in 1934. This dam would feed Colorado River water into the aqueduct. But the water's route to LA was partly uphill. So for two years, metropolitan engineers and Caltech hydraulic experts worked to design the world's most powerful pumps. Parker Dam was finished in 1938. People came from miles around to see the first waters of the Colorado fill the dam. Parker is one of the deepest dams in the world and can store billions of gallons of water. Meanwhile, aqueduct workers carved a 13-mile tunnel through the heart of Southern California's second tallest mountain, San Jacinto. Six feet a day was considered great progress. In 1938, a final blast shattered the last rock from the tunnel. Let her go! Coachella is one of 37 tunnels to carry water 390 miles to Los Angeles. Engineer As nationwide radio broadcasts covered the event, the aqueduct's final concrete was poured in 1939. Six solid years of 24-hour workdays had come to a close. By June 1941, the first Colorado River water rolled into L.A., Pasadena to be exact, where the Metropolitan Water District's annual floats in the Rose Parade had become a well-loved tradition. Earlier that year, Metropolitan even took home a first prize. 1941 held somber news as well. America went to war. War-related industry came to Southern California, and water demand increased. Metropolitan's aqueduct water became vital to the war effort. The aqueduct was patrolled constantly and even camouflaged at times. At the gene plant, a concrete wall was built to protect the transformers from sniper fire. General George Patton set up a desert training camp nearby to prepare over a million soldiers for combat in North Africa. Camp and tank tracks are still visible today, crisscrossing the desert floor. Metropolitan stepped in to help the troops, supplying water, power, and telephones. At times during training, tanks tore up Met patrol roads and even crashed into the aqueduct, but the water kept flowing. California was becoming the most populous state in the country. Southern California was on its way to becoming the hub of one of the biggest economies in the world. Cities, agriculture, and industry all demanded more water. As usual, Metropolitan was planning ahead. By 1952, the aqueduct was the largest domestic water supply line in the U.S. Yet a multi-million dollar expansion was already in the works. And there were kudos, too. In 1955, Met legends Robert Deber and Joseph Jensen celebrated the naming of the Colorado River Aqueduct as a civil engineering wonder. They toasted with Metropolitan water, of course. The 1950s expansion was massive. 30 more pumps, 10 additional uphill delivery pipes, and more than 165 miles of pipelines and tunnels were added. The Weymouth plant's filtering was doubled to 400 million gallons a day. More power from Hoover was brought in. 
This huge undertaking was supervised by the Met's board of directors, seen here inspecting the progress in May 1959. Lake Matthews was increased to its new 70% larger capacity by 1961. Metropolitan members gathered to celebrate at the dedication. The Colorado Aqueduct System was finally delivering the capacity it had been designed for 30 years before. By the 60s, Governor Brown was navigating the Feather River Project through a political quagmire to create the State Water Project. It would become the world's largest water conveyance system, with Metropolitan its largest customer. Oroville is the crown jewel of the State Water Project as the world's largest earthen dam. It was built with the world's most advanced equipment and brute force. Further south, at the Edmonston pumping plant, the water had to be lifted up and over the Sahachapi Mountains. This demanded state-of-the-art pump engineering. State engineers went to extreme lengths to create the best. These pumps became the most powerful in the world. In Southern California, Metropolitan began to update and lay new infrastructure to prepare for the influx of state water. The biggest concrete pipes in the world were used, and a special pipe mobile was designed to move these enormous 17-foot diameter sections. The State Water Project was finally finished. Its water reached Southern California for the first time in 1972, filling Castaic Lake. A year later, water was delivered to Lake Paris. During the 60s, new ideas arose to address the burgeoning population and its water needs. Water purification was being explored. And turning ocean water pure, desalinization began to be studied. More water was still needed. The Delta's peripheral canal was supposed to be part of the state water project's completion, but the effort to build it died when the voters rejected its construction in 1982. The Delta gets more water inflow in a year than the Colorado River does. Efforts to protect the natural environment and assure adequate water supply and quality continue. In the 70s, California was hit by the worst single-year drought in history. Rationing was planned, and Metropolitan began a massive public outreach to teach the public about water conservation. Water that you drink, would you stop to think? Where does it come from? Consumption was cut 15%. Water fit to drink. Ensuring water quality also was an increasingly urgent issue as standards facilitated by new detection technology became more stringent. In 1985, a state-of-the-art water quality laboratory was opened across from the Weymouth filtration plant. By the 80s, water conservation and recycling took on a more important role, and ecological issues had engaged the public. Metropolitan took the lead by launching educational programs, which for 20 years have taught over 3 million students and teachers throughout Southern California. In the late 1980s, another drought hit. Conservation strategies were rolled out, including long-term ones like low-flow toilets and shower heads. By 2002, Metropolitan and its member agencies had rebated the two millionth ultra-low flush toilet. In 1999, we started the community partnership program. In these communities, what we want to do was uh, create awareness of water conservation, of water quality, and uh, any kind of issues that dealt with water quality, and we wanted to educate the people in the communities. Agriculture and industries were encouraged to conserve too. Water, as a precious resource, became one of the most daunting issues of the time. The new millennium brought a new awareness. Attempts to balance the needs of California's residents, industry, agriculture, and the environment now became part of the mainstream consciousness. New technology has made it possible that outdoor water conservation provides an opportunity for significant water savings. The Met launched its Landscape Heritage Campaign, promoting California-friendly and native plants, which need two-thirds less water. In 1995, construction began on what was to become one of the largest reservoirs in the country, Diamond Valley Lake. The site was carefully selected, and cutting-edge environmental awareness was brought into play. 
the valley was walled on three sides and filled with water. Hundreds of acres of surrounding land were preserved as a priceless ecological reserve. In March 2000, the lake began filling and was dedicated in a series of events attended by over 10,000 people. These four aircraft are flying in the shape of a diamond. Three years later, Diamond Valley Lake was open for recreation. At Hoover Dam in October 2003, national, state, and local leaders gathered to celebrate another milestone in California water history the signing of a resolution to decades of old Colorado River disputes. Known as the Quantification Settlement Agreement, the document embodies a collective approach as to how seven basin states and parties within California are going to share the Colorado River water in the 21st century. Today, we celebrate an historic event on the Colorado River, the river that brings life to this arid part of the West. With the signing of the Colorado River Water Delivery Agreement, we are resolving issues that have been unresolved for 70 years. Metropolitan and its member agencies continue to plan ahead. Today, sole reliance on imported supplies is a thing of the past. Thanks to the vision and leadership of Metropolitan and its member agencies, Southern California citizens are among the lowest per capita users of water in the Western United States. I'm not sure that the founders of the Metropolitan Water District would be surprised at what we have accomplished. You know, they provided all the tools, the financial structure, the democratic process, the invitation to everybody in the region to participate in the decisions we make uh, about our water. They really thought through very well in preparing this institution to do what it's done and what it's gonna to continue to do. They might be surprised at the traffic, uh, at the number of people here, but in our ability to meet those challenges and adapt to the changes, I think they understood well what they were creating. As the district has grown these 75 years, so has its water wisdom. This new reality will be Metropolitan's legacy for future generations, water for Southern California's future where we no longer take water for granted, but treasure it as one of our most precious resources.